Welcome to the local campaign. Our debate today is for the riding of Kanata Carleton. I'm going to introduce the candidates for the June 7th election in that riding in just a few moments. But first, let me go over the rules for the debate. Each candidate will have an opening statement of 60 seconds in length, one minute. The order for those opening statements was drawn at random before we began our telecast. And then we're going to move into a series of debates about the important issues in Kanata Carleton and throughout the province of Ontario in this provincial election campaign. To start off every discussion, I'm going to direct a question at one of the candidates. That candidate will have 45 seconds to respond to that question. Then we will open it up to several minutes of debate from all of the candidates. And we'll wrap up by going back to the candidate to whom I originally directed the question, and he or she will have 30 seconds to wrap up on that topic. We'll move through a number of different topics that way, make sure we cover a lot of the big issues that are facing Kanata Carleton and the entire province over the course of our debate today. And then we'll wrap up with closing statements. Those will be in the reverse order of the opening statements, opening statements which again were drawn at random before the telecast. So let's meet the candidates who are here for our debate Again, in the riding of Kanata Carlton, starting with the NDP candidate, John Hansen. Representing the Trillium Party is Jack McLaren. The Libertarian candidate is Peter Dontremont. The Green Party candidate is Andrew West. The Liberal candidate is Stephanie Magnum. And the Progressive Conservative candidate is Marilee Fullerton. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us for the debate today. And we'll start with the opening statements. And again, we'll begin with John Hansen of the NDP. Go ahead. You have one minute. Hi, I'm John Hansen, Andrea Horvat's NDP candidate in Kanata Carleton. I want to thank you for sharing your time with us today. I've lived in Kanata and the Ottawa region for 40 years. It's been a great place to work. It's been a great place to raise my family. And I hope it'll, I hope it'll be a great place to retire. In this election, you don't have to choose between bad and worse, between the status quo and the negative change. You can choose change for the better. You can choose the NDP. A vote for John Hansen is a vote for Andrea Horvat. It's a vote for the NDP platform, a platform that is progressive, a platform that's fiscally responsible and sustainable, a platform that's available online. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next is the Trillium Party candidate, Jack McLaren. Go ahead, you have one minute. The job of government is to help people. For those of us that are blessed with our health and our wealth, we don't need much help from government. But there are many in our communities who need help and cannot help themselves. I would say that falls into three main categories. Families that are dealing with developmentally disabled people, mainly autism, families dealing with mental health troubles, and struggling senior citizens. It is a moral, as a caring society, we have a moral obligation to help those who cannot help themselves. That is the job of government. Okay, thank you. Next, we have the Libertarian Party candidate, Peter, Dont Peter Dontremont. Go ahead, please. Hi, I'm Peter Dontremont. I'm a Maritimer, Acadian. I grew up in the Maritimes and now live in Ottawa. I, I, IT professional and an entrepreneur throughout my career and now I live in Ottawa and I'm representing the Libertarian Party because it's very clear that the taxpayers do not have control over where their tax dollars are spent. Our big push this election is to actually put the taxpayer back in control of how their taxpayers are spent between elections. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next up is the Green Party candidate Andrew West. Go ahead. Yes, the Green Party has the best plan for the environment, but we are much, much more. We have strong, fiscally conservative policies, but they're policies that help people. Now, I need your help because we have an amazing opportunity in Kanata Carleton in this election. We have two conservative candidates creating a split conservative vote. Now, the Liberals will try to scare you as usual and say, well, a vote for the Green is a vote for Doug Ford. Don't split the center vote. And you may think about voting Liberal. But a vote for the Liberals is a vote for the Liberals. This is a party that puts corporate interests ahead of yours. It's a party that will do and say just about anything to get elected. And it's a party that has tripled our debt. A vote for me is a vote for an honest friend 
someone that leads by example, and someone who will represent your interests. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we are going to hear from the Liberal Party candidate, Stephanie Magnum. Go ahead. My name is Stephanie Magnum, and I'm your provincial liberal candidate in Kanata Carleton. I'm a businesswoman, a community leader, a mother, and Kanata Carleton is my home. I've spent 20 years building my community up, and our riding is home to the largest technology park in Canada, the world's greatest farmers, talented small business owners, dedicated public servants, and wonderful communities and people. I recognize that here in Canada Carleton we have a tremendous potential to support our two emerging economic centers, our technology and agriculture sectors. I believe that government exists to help people when they can't help themselves. And I will be your ally and advocate and a voice for all people of every corner of our riding. And on June 7th I ask for your support and your vote. I'm Stephanie Magnum and together we will build a better future. All right, thank you. And finally, the Progressive Conservative Party candidate, Marilee Fullerton. Go ahead. I'm Dr. Marilee Fullerton. I'm a longtime resident of Kanata Carlton <clears throat> for 51 years, a longtime family doc, serving the community for 26 years. I've lived here, raised, raised my kids here, and it's a very, very important community. Looking at uh, the last two years, I've talked to thousands and thousands of people. I've heard uh, the importance of change, that this is a critical time. People want change, they want change in health care. Looking at vulnerable populations like autistic children, people with dementia, who are being left behind. We need a strong universal health care system that supports people and gets them the care they need when they need it. Our hydro is a mess. We need to clean that up and make it possible to bring relief to families and businesses. And our debt, we need to be good stewards of the hard-earned tax dollars make sure that our next generation is not burdened. I, my commitment to you is to work hard in each and every day for you and your interests and to be a positive voice for our community and our riding. Thank you. All right, thank you to all of the candidates for your opening statements. Uh, I'm going to mention, by the way, that there is one other candidate who is running in Kanata Carleton, Robert Lebrun of the None of the Above Party, who is not able to be with us for the debate. So. Let's get into some discussion about the key issues for voters in Kanata Carleton and throughout the province. And I'm going to start with a question for John Hansen of the NDP on the subject of jobs and the economy. And what impact would your economic measures that are in your party's platform, including higher taxes on businesses and high income earners, what impact would those measures have on the provincial economy? You have 45 seconds. Thank you for that question. Um, First, we've got to recognize there's a number of things in the, uh, our platform which will actually stimulate the economy. One of them is universal daycare, $12 a day um, for, for a child. And, you know, as the Bank of Canada has pointed out, as the TD Bank has pointed out in a number of studies, this will actually grow the GDP based on uh, the test, all the work they've done in Quebec by about 2%. Uh, another big one is... Um, uh, universal farm pharmacare. When it's fully implemented, we see that reducing uh, costs in the province by up to uh, up from 800 to about 1.8 billion dollars. So those are some of the facets. Okay, it's open to everyone now. Small business is the backbone of the economy of Ontario. <clears throat> if we have a healthy sector in the small business sector, we have a healthy province. We are in financial trouble. We have big debt. We have deficit budgets and we have neglected small business. We will be listening to small business people and doing what they, whatever we can to help them. We have 360,000 regulations in the province of Ontario. We will cut those by 30%. Well, just to challenge, we, you, just to challenge you a little bit on that, Jack, um, you know, we, you, you keep talking about small business, but the reality is it's small enterprise and medium enterprise. Every doctor's office, every accountant is a small business, but Let's face it, it's, it's the people that employ five people, 10 people, 30 people, 100 people. Those are the real businesses um, that, that drive the economy. The well, rest yeah. is service, it's important, uh, but it's, it's also required. Well, Ontario's economy is one of the strongest in the world, and we are leading the nation in our economic growth and outpacing G7 countries. Our economy has grown by over 1 million jobs since the we recession. Are the biggest in the last year nation. alone, we had created 200,000 jobs, merely. And, you know, with the Doug Ford government, um, he's promising to cut $10 billion out of the economy, which will wreak havoc on our growth. And he's also actively advocating for firing of the CEO of, of, of private companies. This is not how we do business. 
business here in Ontario. And as a small business owner myself, I know the Ontario Liberals business uh, believe that taking their t the tax rate, bringing it down by 22% will continue to uh, to help our economy prosper. We've lost 300,000 jobs that are high paying jobs and replace them with minimum wage jobs. That is not progress. We know that small businesses are suffering. We know that people are really staggering under the pressure of the liberal regulations. I speak to people and small businesses every day who tell me how hard it is, that they're having to lay people off, that they're cutting their hours. The children of these people are listening them, to them talk and hearing their parents so concerned about losing their job or losing their business. Well, well, it's important that we talk about regulation because the last time the Conservatives were in power, the last time and they sought efficiencies. We had Walkerton, and, it, and there was a stark, stark reminder of what happened there. Regulations got cut, and actually the last person was an OPP officer who uh, a few days ago uh, uh, engaged in assisted suicide because his life was absolutely ruined by uh, uh, reg deregulation. So when you talk about regulation, you got to talk about, you know, it's not just cut, 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 because if you do stuff in a, in a really poor fashion, that's what it results in. And you make it sound like it's such a simple thing. It's like taking one of these. There's millions of lines of code in it. And sure, any good engineer could take 20% 20, 20 of the code out, but I bet you you'd have all that's, sorts yeah, of problems. John, you, you, you have a carbon tax problem. We have a, we have an, a hydro problem in this province. That's the Clean Energy Act is destroying the potential for business to grow in this uh, province. We actually... Uh, you, you, every business needs hydro to run. Every well, I disagree, sorry, about the Green Energy Act. So let me just give you a quick summary about it because, yeah, it's gotten a bad name. And, and it's not because of the Green Energy Act. It's because of the people who are running it. The Liberals, to their credit, brought in green energy at a time when it was tough to do so and the costs were high. But what they did, instead of having these smaller developments throughout all of Ontario that had local ownership and local management, which is what it should have done and what other countries in Europe, for example, do, they instead sold the contracts to their wealthy corporate friends, many of whom were not even in Canada. And surprise, surprise, many of whom also donated to the Liberal Party. So the Energy Act is fine, but now they want to get anything out of the Energy Act Here, let me, when prices let, are... Let, let me no, just, no, 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 let me just John, put a John, bubble... Let me just put no, John, you've talked a lot. I, so <laughs> now they want to get out of the Energy Act when prices are low. So they want to sell, buy high, and sell low. That's just not the way to do things. Andrew, the problem is, is wind and solar are not viable technologies as it stands today. Okay, your we your know this. data if is you, old. It's not old. It you is. Call, you look at the manufacturers of, of all the wind turbines, you actually contact them directly and read their data. It shows you it's going to take 30 the years okay, to jump replace in its because own we, we are footprint. going to have a discussion about energy policy and electricity prices coming up. Let's steer the conversation back towards jobs in the economy, uh, if we can. So if anybody wants to weigh in jobs, on that. So the one thing I want to say real economy. quick, John, again, sorry, the one thing I want to say just real quick is that the Conservatives and the Liberals are making this a wedge issue about small business and the um, $15 minimum wage, okay? It doesn't have to be a wedge issue. We support a livable wage, but we also support giving tax breaks to the small business, like doubling the employer health tax exemption so they can actually afford to give the workers a minimum wage. It doesn't have to be a split issue. It can be a win-win. Small business is the backbone of the economy. It is important that we bring relief to families and support business and make Ontario open for business again. Our economy depends on the revenue from business to support the social programs, our health care system and public education that we all depend on for opportunity and our futures. Well, without, with, without supporting and making sure that private businesses have options to be prosperous and viable, we're damaging our ability to afford social programs. Well, here's the, here's the thing. The Conservatives want to slash taxes. Already, Ontario has one of the lowest tax rates in Canada, and even uh, with the NDP modest uh, increase, it's still going to have a tax rate that's extremely competitive with the new tax rate in, in the U.S., Trump's new tax rate. So taxes is, is a bit of a red herring. You know, it, it is not taxes which is driving it, and they'll tell you that, and they continue to tell it, and they continue to say, you know, trickle-down economy is the way to go. The, okay. the key to... Well, 
I'm going to I'm going to let a couple of other speak be, people speak because you get the last 30 seconds on this no matter what. So uh, Stephanie you. Magnum, well, I think you wanted to get in on this. There there is a little bit of uncertainty that is happening down south with our changing global uh, global economy and uh, our changing partners around the world. We realize that you know we do need to spread that <clears throat> prosperity a little bit more evenly, and that's why we're choosing to invest into families by providing free tuition for college and universities, free prescription drugs for youth and and our kids and our seniors, and free pre school uh, and child care. So these, all these things are helping uh, create that, you know, global economic, uh, you know, leader that we, that Ontario has become where we're, we're leading on G7 countries and our, and our nation and the U.S. And this is something that we're incredibly proud of, that we've created this environment that, you know, everybody has the opportunity to succeed and we'll continue to build on that. Okay, we're going to have to stop there, but uh, John Hansen, you get the final 30 seconds on this topic. Thank you. Um, the key to future prosperity. The key is innovation. Um, it would be nice if we could bring all the manufacturing jobs back that we've lost, but the reality is, you know, the entire OECD countries, they've all lost manufacturing. Manufacturing is going down. So, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the big aspects of this. Okay, thank you. Next question is for Jack McLaren, the uh, Trillium Party candidate, and uh, we've already touched on it a little bit in the previous discussion, but let's talk about energy and electricity prices, energy policy. And many people have criticized the current level of electricity prices in Ontario, uh, but what specifically can be done to lower energy prices in the province? You have 45 seconds. I had a private member's bill in February called the Affordable <clears throat> Electricity Act. There were 10 points aimed at lowering the price of electricity in the province of Ontario for the benefit of consumers, being people, and for small business people. We will end the Green Energy Act. There will be no more wind and solar facilities built because we cannot afford the subsidies, and that is driving the price of hydro through the roof. We will end the three to $400 million paid for conservation to private companies when we have a surplus of electricity that we sell at two cents per kilowatt hour to the United States. And we will, uh, we will have a level delivery charge right across the province of Ontario because that's an unfair penalty against the rural people of Ontario. Okay, it's open to everyone now on energy policy and electricity prices. One of the big, one of the big problems in the energy field in Ontario is that it's become a plaything, a plaything of the Premier's office. And Premiers do not make good energy planners. They, are, they may be good consumers, they may be a lot of things, but when you have it, have it directed directly by the Premier's office, and this is something that the Auditor General has spoken about, and this is something that if you look at the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers and their reports, you know, they have uh, condemned how uh, governments are making decisions and they're not built on either sound economic practices or sound um, uh, engineering practices. And that's perhaps the biggest thing. Well, you know, sorry, John, uh, I think that it's, it's very important that we do remember how we got here in the first place. And, and we basically inherited a system that was completely degenerated, where almost 50 years had gone by uh, without any government maintaining the system. And that includes NDP government and, and Liberal government and Conservative governments. The Liberal government actually made the necessary investments to upgrade the system, and there is a cost associated with that. Um, but we do realize that people need more help, and that's why we've lowered the average bill to about 20 25%, and in rural and remote communities, that's up to 50%. So we'll co always continue to find ways to help people support them with their hydro. And I understand that people are, are, are struggling with the cost of living, which includes the cost of hydro. Well, one of the reasons, one of the big reasons why your, your hydro rates have gone up is because of your backdoor privatization. Everything that you are currently doing, all the gas plants, all the new facilities, they are all private private contracts and for some reason the contracts are closed nobody can take a look at it and both the conservatives and the liberals have been driving this privatization which is ironic because it was adam beck who originally put hydro ontario hydro together he he, he nationalized and in fact he bought up all the private hydro companies and lower the price and that is the key one of the keys to this is it's a utility and when the utility is owned by private interest 
we're paying double because the dividends goes to pay shareholders and those and not the people of Ontario. John, the Financial Accountability Officer has calculated the sale of Hydro One will generate $6.7 billion over the, over the next 10 years and new technologies are addressing the electricity needs of Ontario and this money is being reinvested in innovation into the electricity this, grid. Sorry, just the a quick thing on the sale of Hydro One because that's just a quick temporary band-aid fix. It's the same things that the Conservatives did in the previous uh, governments before the Liberals. They sold off the 407. Same rationale. The 407 made, has already made 700 mil, uh, 120, almost $120 million this year alone. It is not now, rational. Now, here's, th here's the thing, though. This cut, that the, uh, the, sorry, this rates change that the Hydro's brought in is just a temporary fix. The Auditor General has already told you, everybody, that the rates are going to go up after they get back into government in a few years, after this five-year hold is done. The, what most people here are not telling you is that the lobby for the, Darling, for the nuclear power is so strong. No one else can stand up against it, but the Green Party is. We can get rid of nuclear power by phasing it out. No, yeah, no, no, no nuclear, nuclear power plant has The Green Party's done a no really great of job of, of no reducing, of reducing John, prices. John. John, we let you talk. Hey. No, no retrofit of a darling of a nuclear plant has come in on time or on budget. Um, the OPG has oh, already wait. asked the government to increase their costs by 180 percent by 2026. Andrew, we got to phase all out viable there. energy sources. What? You, you, you're, you're against <laughs> nuclear. You're against fossil fuels. You're against the uh, and, and you want you want these. These wind farms, which are not viable, as we discussed before, you're, you're right. We are against years, energy that the, doesn't do carp, that harms the environment and costs a lot of money. Well, we do want to move into 100 percent renewable energy because it's the smart thing to do. And we can, why, in the meantime, viable. we can shut down Darlington plant, the Darlington nuclear plant, and in the meantime, transition to cheaper water power from Quebec and Ontario instead of selling off power at a surplus at a loss. Well, if, if, you take a, if you take a look a at the Green Party's work in Europe, if you take sense. a look at Germany which is a classic example oh, where the Green Party's been at work. You know, they have been at work. It's cost the Germans 100 billion euros, um, and they've, been, they've introduced solar, they've introduced wind, all good things. But today, today, after spending 100 billion euros, they've got energy poverty, they've got the second highest energy rates in the world, and guess what? They've made zero progress on carbon reduction. We it's need, the Israel. worst we of need, all I'm worlds. Touch on that and then okay. I'm stop well, well, uh, has well been let me have a turn here. So Thank you. We need energy, affordable energy. It requ it's required for our competitiveness. It's required for our economy. And the, the Doug Ford PCs have a plan for that. We will, it, we will discuss issues with wind turbines with communities. We will make sure that the Green Energy Act is repealed so that we don't just have dollars to be redistributed without having discussions with the people and businesses involved. The cap and trade is essentially a slush fund to redistribute dollars. It does nothing to make, maintain our competitiveness. There, we need to bring relief to families, to homes who are suffering at the expense of increasing levels of hydro and to our businesses. It's extremely important that we are respectful of people, their, their livelihoods, their, their homes and their families. We need to bring a, an affordable hydro a plan to the, the uh, province of Ontario, and we can do that respectfully. Well, that's exactly what we've done, Mary Lee, and it's very important to remember that all the blackouts and the brownouts that Ontario experienced, and I'm pretty sure you remember the, uh, the province-wide, you know, blackout that we had in 2003, and, you know, the, the fact that the system needed to be desperately maintained is what we're talking about here. We made those necessary investments to upgrade the system, and as a result, we eliminated the coal fire plants, and we also saved $4.4 .4 billion a year on health care coverage costs alone well, I think um, there's in a reduction in the respiratory illnesses, asthma rates and premature deaths have gone down and we have zero smog days. So this is something that the PCs and the NDPs have all voted against that 25% reduction on people's hydro rates and we'll continue to fight for, for ways for, for people to have lower energy costs. Okay, we'll stop there and we'll go back to Jack McLaren of the Trillium Party for 30 seconds to wrap up on this topic. We would increase dramatically the oversight and accountability over the production and delivery of electricity in the, with the objective of cutting costs, making it more efficient. We would buy back 10% or whatever that percentage would be necessary to take control over hydro ownership, therefore directing and managing the production of hydro in Ontario. It's a monopoly. It's not fair that it's in the private sector. 
as a monopoly, it has to be administered by government for the benefit of all the shareholders, which is the people of Ontario. We will try to negotiate a way and out of... Uh, okay, con that's time. Thank you. And we're going to move on to the next topic now, and I'll direct this question to Peter Dontremont, the Libertarian Party candidate. And uh, the question is one that uh, was submitted by a member of the community. Do you support prov uh, providing funding to uh, Phase 3 of light rail, which would extend the light rail system to Canada? Absolutely not. Uh, I, I appreciate that people want that, that public transportation, but government can't run this. They, they can't run anything. Everything they touch, they have bloat. They have no accountability because they don't need to be profitable. Somebody here earlier said that, the, that government should run uh, hydro. Uh, it's very clear that government can't make a profit whenever it does, and it's not accountable because it doesn't require a profit to do so. Okay. It's open to everyone now on sure, the subject of public transit. I certainly appreciate your perspective. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there is there is no government in history of Ontario that has invested in more transit and transportation than the Ontario Liberals. And we're investing a, over <coughs> $190 billion in infrastructure over the next 13 years to support projects in every single corner of the province. And we'll continue to make record investments in transit, including the investments needed to have the LRT come out to Canada, uh, to Canada Carleton. And we have st strong partners partnerships with our municipalities and we'll continue to work closely with them for these you know to fund these critical infra uh, infrastructure and transit projects but we do know that Doug Ford's cuts uh, you know, the people of Canada Carleton um, can forget about seeing LRT come to, to Canada anytime soon. I, and we, I need to clarify that point. Well, I need to that, clarify you know, that, that point. I need to clarify that point, Stephanie, because Doug Ford has already said and has been very clear that he will support the LRT into as it extends into Canada. He has no, already he said, said that, that he will support Phase Two of the LRT. And if you haven't realized, it's the Phase Three uh, portion of that project that would bring the LRT lines to Canada. Doug so Ford, clearly he does not have any intention Doug to support Phase 3. Doug Ford is very supportive of making sure that transit allows people to be productive, allows them to get to their jobs, return home in a way that improves our economy and supports families and, and people. He's been very clear about his support for transit. It, it, it's it's rather, it's rather interesting well, that we're talking about, yes. 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 We're talking about said Doug that Ford two and it's what, what Doug Ford plans. He's clearly not what, supportive of, what, of what, a, what the Conservative Party plans, not what a bunch of other people plan. It's what Doug Ford. So if he gets up one morning and thinks it's not a good idea, it's not going to happen. Let's face it. Most of us on that's this not, panel agree accurate, that we want light rail to Canada. And when I spoke with uh, Mayor Watson, he said it was a hub and spoke type deal. And, and guess what? In order to make it viable, you need buses. You need buses to get people to the LRT, and you need buses to take them away. And that's why the NDP is going to reverse some of the downloading that the previous Conservative government did on buses and, and sharing the cost with the city. And that would result in an extra $138 million to the OTC, uh, uh, the transit. Everybody here is and, and it would provide affordability and new services. More, extort more money from you to pay for these magical gifts that they're going to give you. They're forgetting the fact that we're $340 billion in debt. The only person here that may not be in for promoting it would be your, uh, Jack here next to me. I don't know his stance on that, but I do know the rest of the parties that are very much oh, taking more of your money to pay for more of their projects so they can say, look at what I've done, pat themselves on the back. Well, well, what I would is, like to say is we would support the spending of the money needed for the rapid transit in Ottawa. It is our riding of Canada Carleton is growing. Canada is definitely a center. A lot of people are living there and there's a lot of them working downtown. So we would absolutely provide the funding necessary to provide the extensions of the LRT as it's required. And how are you paying for it? We're going to cancel corporate welfare. Uh, we gave $50 million to Linar Manufacturing Company to build a manufacturing plant in Ontario. And the, com the, the uh, government of Ontario has been giving money to, they've given up to a, a billion dollars to small businesses and large, well, large businesses, not small businesses. Um, we will cancel the Trillium Foundation Fund, which is $102 million of nice money to give away mm -hmm. to communities, but we can't afford it when we need something as basic as uh, transit. We will cancel Eastern Ontario Development Economic Development Fund for $160 million, the Southwestern Ontario Economic Development Fund of $160 million. So we'll stop wasteful spending and we'll spend it on what's important, in this case, transit. 
I must I admit, with the with I think, Jack is sorry. referring to cutting all these this corporate welfare, and obviously the libertarian, we've had that as our principle going back since our found, founding of our party. And yes, I agree with all that. I just don't think we should sit there and continue to spend like a drunken sailor at a at a, at a casino. So I think most people here, with the exception of the libertarian candidate, agree is that transit is important. The Green Party is no exception. But I do agree that we need to be able to pay for it. And I also agree with the liberals. They actually put in a lot into transit. The problem is, is that they have also increased the debt. And unfortunately, because of that, they can't actually put the money that's needed into transit, that's needed right now. So phase three is not to start. It's going to cost about $185 billion, or $1.5 billion. And it's not going to start till 2031. It actually, six whereas if we were to actually John, the number, John, 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 the John, number John, is six. John, so I have to correct no, you. Six hundred and ten million. Oh, okay, fine. You just talk so much. It's hard to not say when you're telling something important. Sorry, John. Look, so you... the <laughs> so the Green Party would invest an additional thirty would invest thirty five million over four years for transit. That's an increase of one and one and a half billion dollars per year to help get the transit started earlier. There's really no sense in putting it off. Stop spending. Taxpayers' money worth three hundred and forty billion. You, we are in more debt per capita than California. Well, we would invest. We would collect that money in char question charges, parking levies, and land value tax. When so that's look, how we pay. For when it. we look at the level of waste of hard-earned tax dollars in Ontario, it's astounding. Eight billion dollars on an e-health program that is not to, not finished. We have uh, two million, two billion. If I said eight million, I meant eight billion. Uh, two billion dollars on the Presto system. We have or smart city system. We have billions of dollars that have been wasted, that did not need to be wasted. Okay. And those we're talking need about transit, Mary, Mary Lee, yes, and, you know, but that's not well, something that is going to be wasted. But we what, need that ridership to come out to Canada. What we, we are that talking about, come, Stephanie. What we are talking about, Stephanie, is how we will fund it, and that's a critical piece because well, if you, you can't have a good working relationship with our federal partners dollars, and your municipal partners. Absolutely uh, the, you know, agree. We can champion this, absolutely and I will be the agree. one to get to secure the funding. We need to, to be have collaborative. The LRT line we coming need to Canada sooner than 2031. And we need the LRT. We need transit, and we need a way to fund it. And when we are respectful of taxpayer dollars, we will have dollars go farther. Okay, thank you everyone. Let's go back to Peter Dontremont. I asked you the question, so you have 30 seconds to wrap up on this topic. Sure. So everybody here wants to extort more money from you to pay for projects that they want done. Uh, if you look at uh, Mary Lee over here, uh, Doug Ford is talking about the massive expenditure he's going to do in the GTA area, and that doesn't help you in Canada Carleton one bit. Uh, everybody here has a bound vote, so when it comes up, and if, if Doug Ford forces her to vote for it, she's going to vote for more spending, more spending, more spending. Uh, every other, every, the major parties here actually are, have a bound vote, which means they do not have choice. Okay, thank you. The next question is for Andrew West, the Green Party candidate. Uh, let's talk about technology companies like those that are headquartered, some of them are headquartered in Canada. Uh, what measures, and again this is a question that was submitted by a member of the community, so thank you. What measures can the provincial government take to support technology companies like those that are based in the riding? Well, I think if, everyone, if you ask everybody here, we support the tech sector. No one's going to come out and say that they don't support the tech sector. No one's going to come out and say that we're not going to listen to the tech sector. That's just being honest, just as the Green Party will. The one thing I think stands us out from every other party is the investment in clean tech. And again, it's the technology that's taking over. So why not invest in it? Why are we going through with these old technologies, putting so much money into it, when we can invest in the future? So a Green Party platform would invest more in the clean technologies and invest more in the tech sector and listen to the people who know what they're doing. So I'd like to point out that the, the Silicon Valley was not built by government. As a matter of fact, as regulations <coughs> continue to come in, it just gets stifles it and eliminates the competition that built the great Silicon Valley. We, it, we've known to love all those great companies. And the government's not going to be the solution. They're going to be the problem. They need to cut the regulations lower the, the power bills because every one of those servers and every one of those big uh, tech companies run, burn a lot of power and uh, the clean energy is not going to is not going to provide uh, competitive services when um, you bring up an interesting point about silicon valley and one of the things that silicon valley has had is it's got a great venture capital uh, industry there and you know in good times you can walk around with a powerpoint 
um, slide presentation, and that you can raise a million dollars on. In Canada, in, it is difficult to raise money. It is difficult to raise money even if you've got a revenue stream. So that is one of the things that we need to fix. We need to fix um, the VC appetite for Canadian companies, which is not good. We need to herald our, our many advantages that we have, and we're currently not doing it. If you just take a look at, this is one that the auto sector has done. And, you know, they calculate that they have a $20 advantage per employee for, for running in Ontario because our, our health care is, is paid for through taxes. So that gives them a significant advantage over uh, 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 even a low-wage state. And, and those are some of the things that we need to do. Having dental care, having pharma care as universal makes it much easier for startups to appear. Because I know myself, when you try to do a startup, the first thing that when you're attracting people, they say, well, what about benefits? And if you try and even, even if you have money, it's really, really difficult to get a benefit plan for your employees unless you've got eight or 10 employees, which is not the case when you're two or three person startup going at it. Now, speaking you know, of startups. I would say that one of the main things we can do to help any business is look at reducing the red tape. So we would talk to the high tech companies and say to them, what is getting in your way? What can we do to make it easier for you to do business? What can we do to give you the freedom to invent and prosper and take the risk to build your businesses? And beyond that, I would say we leave them, give them the freedom to work and do what they're good at, be innovators and creators. Then we need to work on trying to help export markets for these companies because they're exporting all over the world much as we're provincial and not federal, that doesn't mean we can't be actively involved in trying to help them with trade and working with our federal partners to enhance that. I grew I up, I, I grew you, up, okay. I grew up in Canada and I've watched the whole tech sector develop. I've watched it for 51 years. There's amazing talent, there's amazing people, there's amazing entrepreneurs, but they're held back by the excessive red tape, the excess regulation, and now it, the issues with our education. So we have a skills gap so that the employers in the high tech are finding it harder and harder to find people to fill those jobs because they need specialized knowledge and skills. And I think there can be better collaboration between the tech sector and our education sector Sector. And we're seeing that happen with places like Algonquin College and the DARE program. And our government will understands, a PC government understands the important that people be trained for the jobs that exist today and tomorrow and that our prosperity and the opportunity for everyone depends on that. So education needs to be coupled with the tech sector. We can improve on that and we can improve our economy. Well, one of the keys to success, Marilee, it has been our Liberal government's support of our Ottawa technology sector and right here in our riding of Canada Carleton. And, and since the launch of the Jobs and Prosperity Fund in 2015, uh, we have invested $950 million in, you know, um, you know, that support and leverage other investments of approximately $12 billion, which have helped create 55,000 highly skilled jobs across Ontario, and a big chunk of that right here in Canada Carleton. And we continue to support, uh, you know, the Ford Motor Company uh, in investing $1.2 billion for research and development uh, center in Ottawa and hiring 295 engineers. You know, we'll continue to work with with uh, General Motors, uh, who's announced an increase in the number of software engineers it, em it employs. I've spoken. Ottawa's well, BlackBerry and QNX Autonomous Vehicle Innovation Center, Sengen. I mean, these are all uh, tremendous uh, companies that are, are are happening right here in Canada, Car uh, Carlton, which is you know uh, you know providing that innovation and putting us on the leading edge and the cutting edge of technology and mar putting our name on the map on the on a global level. You I've know, one of the, one of the things here is that the Liberals will sell you all the new jobs they've created but in Canada let's face it we're still not back to the same level of employment that we were in in, in the year 2000 so we've had roughly 15 years of, of liberal uh, government and we're not having a boom time out we there if you if, if you go out to Canada if you go out to Canada you will see lots of empty space you will see I have a couple of, of, of volunteers on my campaign team uh, brand new computer science degrees can't get a job so they're coming and helping me I'm happy with that but I'd rather them be working so we have some things to do and I agree with Jack that red tape is a problem 
it needs to be seamless, especially for entrepreneurs. They can't hire somebody to fill out government paperwork. That Every, is absolutely ridiculous. Everybody here is trying to be altruistic with your taxpayers' dollars. They're, they're, based, they're not actually respecting the taxes you pay. They want to say, look what I've done, when in fact they should just get out of the way and let people invest in companies that they believe in the product. They'll, they'll, if they have a product that's decent, people will invest, uh, and the government should just be out of the way. Well, one of the things that you might look at is British Columbia. They have an investment plan for small startups. They, they allow about $100 million in, in um, tax deductions a year. And you say, well, gee, that's tax dollars that we lose. Actually, if you look at the longitudinal studies on it, it returns $6 back, an ROI, return on investment of $6. Um, on, on, all, on the taxes That's given away. Where so that is, programs like in. that are the ones that the NDP are for. Then simple, so simple programs that, that, that entrepreneurs can take advantage of and that have good return on investment. That's you know, also, that pay back $6 okay. on each tax dollar really spent. That's also where transit comes in because we have to get Ontario moving again. In, in um, Canada, we have traffic gridlock uh, for hours every day. It cuts down on productivity. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, I asked you the question, Andrew West, so you have 30 seconds to wrap up on this. So I agree that there's too much regulations. It's like an open road, and every time a new government post comes in, they want to put their mark on it, so they put a new stop sign or a new stoplight. And eventually, all you're doing is hitting all these stoplights. The Green Party wants to support public funding and research and development, establish provincial government procurement rules, create investment tools, and have the apprenticeship of one-on-one -on -one equal so there's not two, appren two apprentices for each one apprentice. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Next question is for the Liberal candidate Stephanie Magnum and uh, let's talk about ethics and accountability. Uh, I think a question that a lot of voters have is how can we be sure that your government has learned from its past mistakes and scandals? Um, look, there, there, there is no government without fault, and um, if we if we take a look at at the, this government's record, which is you know unprecedented in, in, in its uh, compassion towards you know providing uh, the number one you know resource in people is Ontarians is the people, and that's what we've chose to invest. Uh, and there is a stark choice between care versus cuts, and because of the the pace of change that we are enduring right now in in the world with you know the the change environment down south we realize that we need to you know to, to spread that prosperity a little bit more evenly and that's why we will continue to invest in in the care that people need and government exists to do the things that people can't do for themselves okay it's open to everyone well let me just comment on the uh, the care versus cuts issue first of all it's, it's kind of hypocritical to see someone from the Liberal government talking about their compassion when they've cut billions of dollars from patient services. We have patients that can't access the care they need. We have a growing mental health crisis. We have an opioid crisis that has not been addressed. And, you know, when I see people suffering and not getting the care they need when they need it, um, and there's cuts going on, but someone is saying it's all about compassion and care versus well, cuts. Marilee, where is I your have compassion? a hard time with that. Where is your compassion when you, you, know, you have these tweets <coughs> that you say some politicians and health executives tell me that private health care must come, uh, but they won't say we, it publicly? We need, I mean, what is that? Well, that Where's your compassion we need, in that? We need universal health care, a strong universal health care system that will allow people to get the care they need when they need it. So where is your compassion Absolutely. when you say Ontario has short-sighted legislation that currently prohibits private provisions of medically necessary well, care? Where is your compassion we, with that? Absolutely. We know that there are more and more technologies, that we need universal health care, that we can be more efficient, that the growth in bureaucracy has expanded so much so that we're spending billions on, on services that are not frontline care. While people are suffering in long-term care, they're not getting the mental health services they need. Well, we need a you robust know, I, I'm not going to apologize for being passionate system. about every uh, Ontarian's but it right is to, to access free universal to, it is quality health care. It is hypocritical to use a slogan like care not cuts to try to cover up 
the cuts to care. You know, I Pati think, patients I think quite frankly, are real. You know that patients you know the, 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 the health and well-being of Ontarians is being undermined, and especially the vul our vulnerable and disenfranchised people. Everybody in Ontario is, has the fundamental right to access health. Uh, our health care system, high Absolutely. quality health care and, and we need, education. Uh, we need a, a system that we can actually access. And I agree that there have been a lot of cuts and that a lot of people in Ontario are not getting the health care that they deserve. But that's actually from the Liberal government. Ontario doctors are calling out, telling you, don't vote Liberal. The cuts have been outrageous that they're experiencing. And whether there's been, going back to the question of ethics, whether there's other tweets and other blogs that's not the, really the point. The point is, is that as far as being ethical, you should just come out and say what your position is. But you know, if, when, when, when Tim Hudak was premier or was the leader of the PC party, he was advocating for a carbon tax. And if Mary Lee was here and he was still a premier, or the leader, she would be advocating for a carbon tax. Now she's saying, cut the Green Energy Act. The Liberals are the party that tripled our debt and then come out and said to you, okay, this is what our, we, we go, no, this is what our deficit is going to be, only $6 billion. I, I well, would like to ask Mary Lee. The accountability office said, no, it's going to be twice that. I would like so to, can you really trust the Liberal government that's willing to tell you they're going to hide $6 billion from you? I, I would like to ask Mary Lee a real simple question that was brought up and we got off tangent here. And that's the question, and I want to be really clear on this. Do you support a single system in Ontario, or do you support a hybrid or a um, dual system of, of health care in this province? I support a universal health care system in which people can get the care they need when they need it. Is that? A universal health care system in which people can get the care they need when they need it, because people are important. Their lives are important. Their families are important. And we must no, be respectful no, no. Do you, do you of you support a hybrid system, yes or no? I, I support a system that is universal. Hybrid, yes or people. no? Simple question here, I, yes or no? I support sis looking at systems that do things better than we do, and I think we need to be humble. Oh, so you do support a hybrid system. I, I look, I'm saying look at solutions from around the world. Don't look at the U.S. They don't have the solutions. John, let's look to Europe. Let's John, look to other places for universal, universal health care. Everybody a successful universal health care also has private options. Every country that is successful in Europe that's doing this has a private option. Now, that being said... There's no shortage of money going to health care. The problem is it's mostly being tied up in administration of lints. Almost 50% of our entire budget, we can hire tons of doctors, tons of nurses, tons of actual people that are actually frontline workers uh, in our health care system just by getting rid of the excessive bureaucracy. We have, we have all the financial accountability that we need in the province of Ontario to control wasteful and wrongful spending. What we need is the political will to listen to the offices. We have an ombudsman. We have an auditor general who is very good. We have a financial accountability office. If anything, we're almost over-regulated, but in the, in the business of accounting for government spending, we are obviously not. But we also have a government that does not have the will to listen to those auditors. When Bob Shirelli says the uh, auditor general doesn't, know, it, it doesn't <clears throat> know anything about hydro because it's a complicated issue, and she came from Manitoba Hydro, I think he's way off base. We have oh, all sorry. kinds of scandals, like the Orange Air Ambulance, like the uh, Presto Card, like the close, closure of gas plants to win seats in Mississauga and Oakville. We have 812 provincially owned office buildings that are vacant, that we pay $19 million a year to, to cover the cost of running them. We spent $58 million on advertising last year, the government did, to tell us how good they are. The Ontario government spends a billion dollars a year on subsidies and tax credits for businesses. We have all kinds of welfare that I mentioned earlier, like the Trillium Fund, the Southwest and Eastern Ontario Economic Development Funds, and, and corporate welfare givings away. If we listen to the people that are giving us the oversight and accountability at Queen's Park, and that's their jobs, things, and we have the political will to do that, the business affairs of the government would be properly run. But the question here was about ethics. And again, it doesn't matter what someone's position is. Just be honest about it. Kanata Carlton, you deserve to know who you're voting for and what you're going to get. Not more broken promises. It happened in the last federal election, and it's happening in this one. 
I'm being honest with you, I will tell you straight up what our positions are and how we're going to pay for it. And every other candidate should be as honest. You deserve it. Well, moving forward, I think that, you know, all parties have a lot to take a look at in, in terms of how we can do better when we have encountered uh, a discrepancy. And so wow, there's a lot of there's a lot of lessons to be learned. And you know what? I mean, this is, this is something that we all agreed. Sorry, all parties had agreed to all parties had agreed to, you know, of the closure of the gas plants just to let everybody know. But I think it's very important that, you know, there is no party that, um, uh, you know, that ha is not without fault. And we will continue. We need to look at ways on how we can move forward and and and, and ensure that these uh, that these lessons are learned moving forward. But you know, okay. back to um, our. I'm going to see if anybody else time. wants the to talk, auditor. just because you do get the final 30 seconds, uh, okay. like Stephanie Magnum. Like so, Marilee like Fullerton, the, you you can go the first. The Auditor General has come out with a scathing report on the energy program of the Ontario Liberal government, and people should read it. It's it's. It's really very important that you know what's going on and the cooking of the books. Okay, we're going to stop there. Thank you, everyone. And I did ask you the question, Stephanie Magnum, so you have 30 seconds to wrap up on this topic. Thank you. Well, the Auditor General uh, uses those same accounting guidelines that all parties have to adhere to, so it's really um, undermining even the way the Conservatives calculate their spending uh, when, you're, when you're questioning the Auditor General's uh, work. Um, you know, back to the, uh, the increased uh, investments in our health care. We are the only party that have continuously uh, in increased our investments year after year after year, Marilee, uh, in, in every single year. And we're allowing to treat more patients, reduce the wait okay. times in some of the shortest of the country. Thank you. Thank you uh, to all the uh, candidates for participating in those debates. We are now going to wrap up with some closing statements from each of the candidates. Once again, they will be 60 seconds in length and they will be in the reverse order of the opening statements. So we're going to start with progressive conservative candidate Marilee Fullerton, you have one minute. Go ahead. Thank you. June 7th is a critical election. We are facing an unprecedented time of change. We need a new government, and people are telling me at the door. I've spoken to thousands and thousands of people over the last two years who tell me it's time for change. It's a clear choice to bring relief to families and open Ontario for business again, or more years of Kathleen Wynne or other governments who will spend and dig the deficit and the debt a bigger hole for our next generation. We must be respectful of our next generation, of the people who work so hard for their tax dollars. We need to bring respect. And my commitment to you is that I will work hard for you each and every day to make sure that your voice is heard. I will be a positive voice, a collaborator to look for solutions, not only for our riding, but all across Ontario. And on June 7th, please Please consider me as an option. I will be an open door policy person. I will hear you. Okay. I will work for you. Thank you. Next is the Liberal candidate, Stephanie Magnum. Go ahead. You have one minute. As your MPP, I will fight to provide more care and opportunity that allows everybody in Kanata Carleton the opportunity to <clears> succeed. <throat> this election, there is a lot at stake, and we need to protect those investments in child care so that more mothers and families can get back to work. We need to protect the investments that we've made in our hospitals and our frontline workers. We need to protect the minimum wage increase so that every Ontarian can earn a living wage. We need to protect our health care system, and we believe that everybody deserves the access to high quality health care. Kanata Carleton needs a strong voice to champion our riding issues, and I'm very proud to be that voice for you, and I will look forward to serving all of us uh, in the community of Kanata Carleton. And on June 7th, I ask for your vote and your support. Thank you very much. God bless. Okay, thank you. Next up is the Green Party candidate, Andrew West. Go ahead. I hope that after this debate, you feel like I'm the best candidate and that I would do the best job for you. Time and time again after the local debates, people come up to me with their red pins and say, wow, you did such a good job. Or conservatives would say, oh, you should join us. Well, if you think I'm the best candidate, then just vote for me. Far too often, voters vote for the three parties that they're told to vote for by the big media conglomerates. When did it become normal? in Ontario to not elect the best candidate. I'm a hard worker because I'm going up against the wealthy established parties and I'm holding my own. And if this was a movie, many of you would be rooting for me to win. 
Well, you can help. Go to andrewwest.ca and order a lawn sign. Invite your friends over and invite me over to talk. But most importantly, on June 7th, vote Andrew West. I hope to make you proud. Thank you. Next is the Libertarian Party candidate, Peter Dontremont. Go ahead. Hi. As a Libertarian candidate, you know, everybody, most of the parties here have bound voting. Therefore, they are not really representing you. When, they, when, you, when the party determines that they have to vote a certain way, they are threatened with punishing of voting the way they want. If you elect me as a Libertarian, I will respect my, my riding, my constituents, and I'll fight for the Libertarian principles that the rural uh, Carleton and the uh, IT t t sector in thing are looking for. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Jack McLaren, Trillium Party candidate, you're next. My name is Jack McLaren. I've been the MPP for Carlton Mississippi Mills for the last six and a half years. For most of the first few years, I was a member of the PC party, and I very quickly learned that I would, did not have the freedom to speak. I did not have the freedom to vote on behalf of my constituents. I would be, would be told what to say, told how to vote. Most of the votes were whipped, and absolute loyalty to the party was demanded. That is the denial of democracy. Uh, last April, I joined the Trillium Party of Ontario so that I could have the freedom to be your voice, be your vote, and that I have the freedom to come and speak with you and listen to you and develop policy for the Trillium Party based on what you tell me is right and what is wrong. I work for you. Okay, thank you. Finally, John Hansen, NDP candidate. The floor is yours. A vote for change is only the start. Change must be for the better. It must provide a prosperous, stable, well-run province that provides the services that are needed, provides equal opportunities for all Ontarians, your children, your grandchildren, and not just those at the top. If you want that kind of change, change for the better. Vote John Hansen and Andrea Horvat. Vote for the NDP platform, a platform that's progressive, a platform that's fiscally responsible and sustainable. Together, we can do better. Together, we can make our lives better. Finally, a vote for John Hansen is a vote for someone who will listen to all members of the riding. Thank you. Okay. Thank you to all the candidates for participating in the debate today. Best of luck to you in the final few weeks of the campaign. And I want to remind our viewers that we will have live local election results on the evening of June the 7th, starting at 9 o'clock when the polls close in Ontario, simulcast on 1310 News Radio here in Ottawa. I hope you'll be able to join us then for the results. Thanks for watching the local campaign.